fortunate to have with us Dr. Gerald Tarlow, a.k.a. Jerry, um, who is a very experienced and well-known therapist working in the area of anxiety disorders, and um, in particular OCD, which is going to be the focus of our interview and uh, Q&A today. Do you, um, you work generally, I saw your publication, so you're a generalist in anxiety disorders, right? Yes, I probably treat all anxiety disorders, but the more common ones that I treat are OCD, panic disorder, specific phobias, social phobias, and generalized anxiety disorder. And what is, what's missing? PTSD, primarily. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. You don't have to do that. We have another speaker okay, coming good. in for that, so good. you don't have to develop an expertise there. Um, okay, so um, were you always interested in uh, the anxiety disorders, your whole clinical career, or did something um, move you in that direction? Uh, I actually have been interested since graduate school because when I was in graduate school, it was certainly one of the disorders that there were effective treatments for mm. and that psychologists were focusing on specific phobias, even in colleges, things like test anxiety. Right. So it was very easy to, to uh, get uh, information about that and get treatment for that even back in those days. Right, yeah. right, right. But, but interestingly, um, OCD, which has been around for a very long time, and we can see cases of it throughout history, um, but I probably didn't see a patient with OCD until the mid-1980s or so, the late 1980s. They were out there. They were either misdiagnosed or they weren't getting they weren't getting treatment at all. Well, let, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, historically, you're saying there's historical uh, evidence that people have had uh, what we now call OCD for a long, long time. Are there some famous individuals that are often cited? Sure. I mean, again, probably the most famous, and you know, there was a movie about him, and I guess. Oh. This land once belonged to him, right? Yeah, this, yes. this building, this building. This building once belonged to him. Hughes Raytheon, yeah, yeah Howard, Howard Hughes. Hughes if, um, Have you all seen that a movie? Um, what, what was the name of the movie? I forget the, the, I forget the title of the movie, actually, but it was about Hughes' life. Yeah. And it very clearly demonstrated how severe his OCD was. His OCD was so severe that at one point he was sort of living in a bubble so that no contamination could get could get to him and that was the that was the essential um, obsession with germs and contamination exactly yeah. uh, I saw the movie yeah. a long time ago and the thing that st struck me or stuck with me is that he never trimmed his fingernails mm -hmm. yeah. his fingernails were like Guinness Book of World yeah. Record yeah. long yeah is that was that related to this? Uh, I'm sure it was part of his OCD. Yeah, um, it was. Must have Would you like to have treated him? Would I? Um, absolutely. You could have charged him. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's <laughs> true. This this could be my home. That's now. right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll I'll see you for the building, yeah, Howard. Yeah. Uh, and last question on the movie. Um, do you know who played him? Yeah. DiCaprio played mm -hmm. him. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. So, but even if you go through history, you can see other cases where people clearly had OCD. Um, but again, there, there, there weren't psychological treatments. There weren't medical treatments in terms of medications. Um, and again, I think an awful lot of people were misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they might have been diagnosed especially as being psychotic um, at the time or schizophrenic and certainly not treated for OCD. That all changed in the mid-80s with the book called The Boy Who Couldn't Stop Washing. Right? And that sort of educated the public that this is a, a specific problem, a specific problem area, 
and that there were actually there was actually some treatment for it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, then it started to get onto TV and and you know talk shows and everything. And people would read the book and they'd say, "Huh, I do that too." And and they realized that they had OCD. Right, right. Um, so what would people do beforehand? I mean, they'd just go to talk therapy and spin their wheels, basically, for a long time? Uh, that's primarily what, what people did. Either they didn't get therapy for it, mm -hmm. or they went to traditional therapy. Um, there's no evidence that traditional psychotherapy or talk therapy really helps OCD. Um, there are cases that I've had in my career where I've had people in traditional therapy for 20 years and not gotten any better in terms of their OCD. So the, at, the, at this point, again, it's really not being used at all in the treatment of OCD. Are there people who are still using that inappropriately? Yes. Um, there are there are people using a lot of things inappropriately, even some of the techniques that are part of cognitive behavioral therapy but are not effective for the treatment of OCD. An example of that might be something like relaxation training. Relaxation training is a very common technique that's used for a lot of different anxiety disorders, but it's really not used at all. It's actually contraindicated in the treatment of OCD. Why is that? I mean, you think that if it's an anxiety disorder, that re relaxing yeah. would be effective. What One of the main things that you want people to experience who are in treatment with OCD is actually feeling the anxiety mm. and seeing it go away all by itself, basically, without doing anything to uh, force it to go away. Relaxation training w would, in that sense, be something that would make the person feel more comfortable and they wouldn't realize that they could tolerate the anxiety. Uh, taking an anti-anxiety medication, medication like Xanax would not be used in the treatment of OCD because again, it would do the same sort of thing that the relaxation training would do. Are you familiar with um, acceptance commitment therapy? Yes, somewhat. Because Because they have a, a different approach to discomfort in, in which they don't try to stop the discomfort in any active way. They have the individual kind of accept it right. and allow it to diffuse or dissipate. Would that fit into the closer to the conception than a more traditional a CBT kind of work? Well, it, it actually does fit into the, to the treatment of OCD in that sense, because it is something very similar to what we do. There is, a, there is an exposure aspect. If yes. you don't fight it and you just yeah. try to let it flow through you, try to do, diffuse out, and don't fight it, that would be a kind of exposure. That, that's absolutely true. And, yeah. and, I, and that, that would be very compatible with CBT for OCD. On the other hand, it might not be with some of the other um, anxiety disorders. Mm. For example, the difference between treating someone with a specific phobia. Like let's say somebody has a uh, fear of heights and you want to basically teach them to relax. You want to teach them that they actually can control the symptoms, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a very different approach. It's almost a coping approach. Right. Very different than the ACT approach. Right. And so it just depends on the particular problem that you're treating. Yeah, I mean, I've never encountered um, a case analysis or uh, an article maybe you have that has applied ACT to OCD, but just in hearing you talk about the importance of not trying to, um, trying to just expose oneself and tolerate the anxiety, uh, it just sort of seemed like a natural companion to that kind of work, yeah. yeah. I, I think it is, and, and the, the, one of the things that I will guarantee every person that I work with, that 
if they don't do a compulsion, their anxiety will diminish, right? Because it's a natural process in our bodies. It has to diminish. It can't stay at these high levels for an exceedingly long period of time. Well, go into that a little bit more. Why by not, uh, maybe, maybe we should back up a little yeah. bit and you can sort of introduce the, um, the ERP uh, method, right? Exposure and ritual prevention is the core uh, treatment. That's so correct. if you can maybe give um, an introduction to that and then we can go into why not uh, doing the ritual will be, um, you, can, you have a perfect prediction that it will be helpful. Yeah, sure. The, the major technique that's used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder is, a, is called ERP, exposure and ritual prevention, exposure and response prevention, same, same thing. Um, and basically the idea is to expose people to what they're afraid of. So if you're afraid of touching a doorknob because it might be contaminated, Contam the fear of contamination would be the obsession, then we actually have you touch doorknobs purposely. and Rub your hands all over doorknobs, right? Maybe even then put your hands in your mouth after you touch the, the doorknob. And what happens at that point is that the person starts to feel very anxious, right? You've just had them confront one of their fears, right? So their anxiety goes up. Right? What they would normally do without treatment is go wash their hands, clean their hands off, right? do something to, in their minds, get rid of the contamination. Right? Well, with the treatment, we want to prevent that. That's the ritual prevention or response prevention. We want to prevent the compulsions from occurring. Um, we ask them not to wash. We ask them not to, to clean or check to see if, they're, if there's anything on their, their hands. Um, we don't force them. We don't force anybody, you know, say, and put, hold a gun to their head and say, you have to do this. So it's, it is voluntary. Right? Um, and, and then what happens is that as time goes by, there's a couple of things that happen. One thing is that the anxiety will drop over time, right? And we know that. We know that from experience in working with people. We know that in terms of how our bodies react to anxiety. It's almost, I like to tell people, it's almost like it's being burnt out. It's a candle. It's just, it, it, it's exhausted mm -hmm. and to some extent. So the anxiety will, will drop. And that is based on an old learning theory. Uh, called habituation. And there's still a lot of us who believe in that, that mm -hmm. over time uh, that, will, that anxiety will drop and it almost has to. There's a newer theory which is called in inhibitory learning which basically talks about well the person needs to see that nothing bad happens. They have to experience the anxiety but also see that nothing bad happens. Well, with some of the things like contamination, as I was mentioning, they're not necessarily worried that they're going to get sick in a half an hour, an hour. Right, there's a latency, that, that, right? Yeah, that they maybe they'll get AIDS from touching that, yeah. uh, that, that door handle. Um, so th those sort of, um, the ability to see that it's really okay may take a long time, but the ability to see that the anxiety drops actually is, is a much shorter time yeah. for most people. So that's the general pattern of, of treatment or the general technique of ERP. And what we do is we start with things that are easier for the person. So an example might be, and we'll stick with the contamination example, um, touching the doorknob over there might create a certain level of anxiety for the person that I'm working with. And so let's rate anxiety between zero and a hundred. The person might say, well, that's a, that's a 40, right? Now, shaking hands with somebody may be a 60, right? Um, sitting on a, um, oh, some of my favorite ones. Can I get up with this microphone? Sure. So, you know, sort of rubbing my hands in the, in the carpet and then 
putting them in my mouth <laughs> might be an 80 or a 90, right? That's just um, a fact, Jerry. <laughs> that's just a fact. Um, I, I, do have, I do have one specific rule. What? I never ask anybody to do anything that I can't do myself. Okay. Well, so they have to believe that I'm not really psychotic. You're the gold yeah, standard yeah, of rationality. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we progress from things that are, that are less anxiety producing to things that are much more mm -hmm. anxiety producing. And we try to cover every single fear and every single trigger situation that the person so might have. Would you, would you say that that was, you know, to use an older term, a desensitization hierarchy? In, it, in, in it's, it's not desensitization mm. Mm. in the sense that desensitization used relaxation training, right? And even newer forms of desensitization use cognitive skills. So here, here's an example. Um, a person might say, um, if I touch that doorknob, I'm going to get AIDS. If it were really a desensitization paradigm, first we'd have them relax before they touch the doorknob. Imagine a door, uh, doorknob yeah, or something. Do that. Yeah. Uh, but we also might cognitively try to convince them, oh, that thought doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. right? Uh, let me show you all this data where nobody's ever gotten AIDS from touching a, touching a doorknob, right? And the problem with that is that that actually is a type of reassurance. So it's actually a compulsion to be told that, right? And it doesn't actually help them. Mm -hmm. Most people with OCD actually know that it doesn't make sense, right? But they can't stop doing it, yeah. right? So if we're talking about someone with a fear of heights, talking about I treat a lot of people for fear of flying, oh yeah, all the time I'm gonna teach them breathing skills going to teach them relaxation skills. I'm going to teach them cognitive skills in terms of how to deal with irrational thoughts. Um, turbulence is going to make the plane crash. No, it isn't. Yeah. Right? Um, but that treatment is so different than the OCD treatment. Okay. Okay. So it's a hierarchy, but it's not mm -hmm. a traditional right. desensitization exactly. hierarchy. Yeah. yeah. And do you work on that hierarchy with the individual? Well, you Are can. they an active participant in forming that hierarchy, or is that something you suggest to them? No, they're, they're an active participant in forming the hierarchy, okay. and we, we sort of create it together, mm -hmm. right? In outpatient therapy, they're given an assignment. Sometimes I'll, um, during the session, like what I just did here, I'll model it. I'll show them what I want, want them to do, right? And after they pass out, after seeing me lick my fingers, yes. um, <laughs> the, you know, we, we go on from there and give them assignments to do at home in between the sessions. So that's on an outpatient basis where I might be seeing somebody once a week. The more severe the, the person is, the more they actually need to do the assignments supervised, right? So whether it's a therapist or in certainly some programs that are residential treatment programs, um, they have a coach right. working with them. Show them what to do, now you do it, and now the coach is gonna make sure that the person doesn't do the compulsions afterwards. Right, right. Okay, so um, we're talking around the treatment. I'm thinking maybe it would be helpful just to organize this where we like imagined um, somebody contacting you and let's sort of walk through the assessment and then the planning of the treatment and and how it might sure. go so if um, if I were to call you up and I wanted to get treatment for OCD yeah. we'd schedule let's say on an outpatient basis yeah. okay so we'd schedule an appointment if you could afford it if I could afford it yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right well yeah. Especially since you've worked with, that's, you know, Howard Hughes and right. people right. at Lofty Strata. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. But maybe you do some pro bono work. <laughs> that, okay, that's possible. <laughs> you could use that for yeah. me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so um, I would come into the office, and how would you do the assessment? Would you do the assessment at all on the phone, or would you send them anything? No. 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 Um, I'd certainly wait till they, till they got there. Um, and basically, I have a pretty structured interview in terms of what I want to ask. Most people who come in have already been diagnosed. It's not like 
they, that I'm just seeing this general population. So they know that I'm a spe uh, someone who specializes in treating OCD. So they already know or believe that they have OCD or have been sent by their psychiatrist who believes they have OCD. Right? Um, so I'm really get, trying to get a really good history of the symptoms that they're having, the, OCD, the specific obsessions and compulsions and things that they avoid. Um, and does the development does the developmental picture uh, have any impact on the treatment? In other words, if I came in and I had uh, compulsions and obsessions, maybe that didn't rise to the level of a clinical disorder, but since I was 10 years old, as opposed to it developed, you know, uh, in adulthood, is that? Mm -hmm have any uh, impact on how you would view that individual? I just, I just think that the longer you've had the symptoms, um, basically the more difficult it becomes to, to treat them. So duration is, is an important consideration. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people get very uh, accustomed to their, to their symptoms. They work around their symptoms. They you know, instead of touching that doorknob, right, I have now just, you know, have sleeves long enough so that I can open the doors. Or maybe, I, maybe my family has accommodated me and they open all the doors for me. Mm -hmm. So the more avoidance there is in the person's life, right, um, the more avoidance there is, the less anxiety they're going to feel, right? So there's an awful lot of people with OCD Right, who don't even seek treatment. Right? Well, that's what I was just going to say. If somebody has been at this a long time and has elaborate coping yeah. strategies, um, what is the impetus to come in? Well, um, I'll give you I'll give you a couple of examples. Right. Okay. Uh, here's one that I that um, I remember very clearly. This was a a, a guy that I was treating and he had recently gotten married, right? And he had a problem where every single thing in his house had to be in a perfect place, right? And I really mean perfect. I mean, he knew to the quarter of an inch where things were. Everything had to be lined up. Um, and a lot of things couldn't even be touched or used, right? Now, do you have like a, a category of that? Does that fit it's into symmetry and exactness? Symm okay, so we read about um, an individual who was uh, struggling with a symmetry OCD. Okay. So it's a different. That's a variant of that okay. category. Now, he generally wouldn't allow anybody in his house because if you come in his house, you're going to sit on the couch and maybe move the pillow of the couch, right? Exactly. If you're going to use the bathroom, you're going to touch one of the the towels and yeah. put it out of order. Yeah. He'd let people in and then he'd correct it, right, when the person left, right? Now he gets married. She moves into the house, right? How do you think that relationship goes? That's a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, all of a sudden. Did she have informed consent? Did he like <laughs> share this <laughs> with uh, her? She, or? she knew. Oh, she But did. until she moved in, she didn't it, know the extent of it. She didn't really know the extent of it and didn't really realize how upset he would get yeah. if anything was moved or anything was used. Can, and could you imagine the pressure that she felt being in that household? Yeah. Talk about walking on eggshells. Yeah. That doesn't even quite capture yeah. it. No, it doesn't. So here, here's the, the answer to your question. She says to him, if you don't do, any, do something about this, I'm out of here. Right? Yeah. So you, you ask, what's the motivation for, for someone who has had OCD this severe for so long? Well, if he wants to be in a relationship, he's got he's to change. Okay. Right? And, you know, I think we talk about this not just with OCD, but a lot of, uh, a lot of different problem areas. And, you know, it, does it get bad enough? Is the person in crisis to the point where it doesn't interfere with their life in terms of their relationships, uh, their work. 
I, history. I, I agree with you. I think the duration aspect of a disorder is underemphasized. Yeah. In other words, you could have, we, we had a, a couple of uh, people, we had Colleen in and Andy Christensen yeah. came in, and we were talking about, you know, couple and family issues. And you could have two couples that have the identical um, issue. Uh, Andy, for example, talks about interaction cycles like pursuer, d distancer uh, patterns that he works with in, uh, in couples therapy. But you could have a pursuer distance uh, pattern that has been going on in a single relationship for a couple of years as opposed to something that the person has done a long, long time. Yeah. It's the same problem, yeah. but yep. how do you, how do you, well, yeah, so the duration thing just, I think, makes it a lot harder. From, a, from an anxiety point of view, it shouldn't really be different, but maybe that identity piece you were talking well, about. Well, it's, again, at some point, some of the compulsions become habits. Yeah. They're just done so frequently and so often and so automatically that they're almost not even connected to thoughts. So I'll give you another example. Right? This is one of the first uh, people that I ever treated for OCD. The woman was a compulsive breast checker. Right? Hundreds and hundreds of times a day she would check her breasts. Right? What is she checking for? Breast cancer? Yeah. She couldn't tell you. Right? Believe it or not, she said, I just do this. I don't know why. Okay. Right? It had become so detached from the original obsession and it become so automatic and so learned. Right? But so from the conceptualization that you have as an anxiety disorder, there had to be some anxiety that that she that if facilitated. I, if I didn't do it, I'd feel anxious. That was the that was the thought. But, but think about this for a second. Just think about it in terms of a, ha a bad habit. And, it, and I know it's, it's, it really isn't. It's different. But think about this. If I am a nail biter, right, and I've been doing that for the last couple weeks, and I want to stop, or I'm a nail biter, and I've been doing that for 20 years and want to stop, which person is going to be easier to treat? Sure. Yeah, it's so deeply ingrained. Yeah, I think we'd all we'd all agree, but it's a it's a fascinating question. Why? In other words, if you have a car that has a flat tire and you've been driving around, you know, the flat tire for, you know, ten minutes versus you know ten days, you you know, change the tire. You know, the duration. You get, maybe, but you get used to it at ten at ten days. Yeah. So there's and, something and that becomes part of I identity. So. Something yeah. becomes part of yeah. your your life. Yeah. 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 Okay. So so the person would come in, mm -hmm. and you do this uh, assessment. Um, yeah. No, I, I particularly want to know what the current symptoms are, because if someone has OCD symptoms even from a long time ago, um, let's say they they had a fear of contamination when they were. 12 years old, right? And they don't, they don't have that problem anymore. Well, we're not going to treat it. Right. Right? So I want to know what's going on right now. Do, some pe do people switch categories? Oh, yeah. It's, oh, really? They might start off with contamination and yeah. go to symmetry? Yeah. It, it's um, very, very common. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes they've been treated for those symptoms and they get other OCD symptoms. That's that's not unusual at all, mm -hmm. or there might be something new that triggers an, a new and different symptom mm -hmm. for them. Um, but I want to know what symptoms are occurring right now. What are the obsessions? What are the compulsions? So a lot of the initial sessions focus on, on that sort of assessment, as, as well as the severity of the OCD. You know, I, wanna, I want to know how much it interferes with their life. I want to know how much anxiety it, it causes them. Mm -hmm. um, these are important factors in terms of picking out the right level of treatment for the, for the individual. Level in terms of the what setting, like if they yeah. are doing outpatient weekly versus multi times a week, that, that's what you mean or, by the type of... Or even self-help. Okay. I mean, I, I can tell you one person that I've seen 
had one OCD symptom. He had to make sure when he went away on vacation that any pictures that were over his bed right, had to be moved because he had a fear that they would fall and hit him on the head. Right? It's the only symptom he had, the only OCD symptom. Technically, if he wanted to, I mean, there's many, many very good self-help books. I mean, he could have done this all by himself. Okay. That's a possibility. Right, right. And then at the very severe level, we have people that are so impaired that uh, literally they just, they cannot function. Uh, if you ask me if you'd like to know the most severe sure. person I've ever seen, it's actually a physician. A uh, female physician came into my office. Um, she had to stand in the middle of the office because she couldn't sit down or touch anything in the office. She actually had seven pairs of surgical gloves on. Wow. Right? And so each time she would touch something, she'd take off a pair and th throw it away. Right? This person... It, it, when I saw her, um, she was standing there in the office and her teeth were chattering as if it was, you know, 10 degrees in the office. That's how anxious, physically anxious she was. Wow. Right? How could she? She couldn't, she couldn't work anymore. Yeah. She, she basically couldn't, couldn't function. You can't go out of the house and do anything because the whole world, again, is, is contaminated. Right. She could do telemedicine. Uh, she she could do that. Yeah. That, at that time, that didn't exist. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. That's that really is severe. Yeah. Um, so you're you're getting an assessment of the duration, the level, um, the consequences of it, the impact. Um, do you? Is it all through a structured interview? Do you do any uh, formal assessment? Do a Y box or anything like that? I will do a, a Y box. That's the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. So that gives you a wonderful measure of severity. Um, through the assessment, there's also something called the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive uh, Symptoms Scale. So that basically looks at all the different types of OCD. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go over that with people. Oh, I see. And because you just integrated just, into your just interview. Because, just because someone says, you know, the only problem I have is contamination fears, I don't take that at face value. Gotcha. And, and I have my own little sort of theory about the treatment of OCD that is basically, it's a little bit like a rash, right? So you, you might have one big, big area of the rash on your arm and that may be, let's say, contamination. But then there may be these little tiny areas on other parts of your, your body, like, oh, I, yeah, I line up all the books in my study, something like that, symmetry, exactness, right? Um, I think that it's important if you go to a dermatologist and they say, here's some medicine to treat your rash, you don't just put it on this big spot. You treat all the little ones, too. Yeah. Why do you do that? because you don't want those little ones to become big ones, right? And if you, ne if you neglect it, has that been your experience? Yes. That they'll just Absolutely. move the OCD yep. to a different category? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And for a lot of people, it's easier sometimes to start with treating the little ones and then move on to the, to, to the bigger ones. Right. right. So they learn so, how yeah, to do yeah. the exposures and all that. So I want them to know about all the different possible OCD symptoms. And then I also give them forms to take home where they're going to track all their OCD symptoms during the week. So when they come in the next week, I can see, and again, we're just using the contamination example uh, because it's such a common one. But I can see, oh, here you wash, you had to wash your hands when you touched that doorknob, um, when you shook hands with people, um, when you uh, went to the restroom, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of trigger situations that I get from those, those uh, record keeping. Okay. And so what do you, do you assess uh, as part of the impact, you assess like impact on relationships and 
work and, and a variety of areas. Um, so then you get, a, you get a, an assessment, you understand the severity, and then you would move on to a treatment phase. Well, certainly, again, in the beginning, you, you make sure the person understands what is involved in the treatment. Mm -hmm. It isn't fun. Um, those things may not, touching the floor and putting my hands in my mouth, didn't create anxiety for me. Yeah. But for the per OCD person, it's not fun. It's, it's like bad tasting medicine. You know it's good for you, but certainly doesn't taste good when, you do, when you're taking it. Right, um, right. So they have to understand what's involved in the treatment and be willing to participate in the treatment. Okay, so that's an important factor. But once that, once that happens and once we've designed this, what is called an exposure hierarchy, which again are all these different situations where the person is going to face their fears, right? then basically it's up to me to give them assignments in terms of what they need to do and make sure, and this is where it gets a little tricky because if you've not worked with someone with OCD, um, give, you, give you another example. So let's say, let's say I say to somebody, person says I have difficulty um, if I drop something on the floor, picking it up, right? Um, and if you're not experienced with working with people with OCD, you might say, well, okay, I want you to practice, okay? I want you to practice, you know, dropping something on the floor and just picking it up um, and not washing your hands, right, afterwards. Person comes back the next week and says, well, how did the assignment go? Oh, oh no problem at all. So really? So no anxiety? No, nothing. Well, after you dropped it on the floor, right, what did you do? Well, I just sat there for two hours like this, right? And I made sure I didn't touch anything else. So really, it wasn't a problem, right? So now it's like, oh, OK, I, I screwed up as a therapist, right? I didn't know how to give that person a good assignment. I've got to go back and say, no, you're going to have to rub your hands on the floor, right? And then you're going to have to touch your face, right? You're going to have to touch you know, everything else, your glasses, your phone, everything else, and then no washing, no cleaning until the anxiety drops, right? So it's up to me to be able to create these assignments mm -hmm. that they're going to utilize during, during the week. And then the, the, basically the treatment is the person comes in the next week, how did the assignments go, right? you decide whether you're going to continue those assignments and decide what new assignments to give them for the following week. And how extensive would the um, exposure hierarchy be? How many, how many elements might there be in a typical? Okay. You have, for the guy with the picture yeah. on the wall? One. You have one. Right, <laughs> right. right. Um, or, or very few. This may be some variations of right. it, right? Right, right. Um, but you have, you have very few. Right? Um, literally, you could have a hundred. Really? Yeah. And so the, the funny thing is that cognitive behavioral therapy is basically a short term treatment. You know, someone will ask, how long is this treatment? And if someone has a fear of flying, I can say 10 weeks. Right? If you come in and you do the work, it's going to be 10 weeks. Someone has OCD and says over the phone and says, how long is this treatment? It could be with the guy with the picture. It could be a few weeks. With other people, it could be a few years. Really? Yeah, because there's so many different things that they have. And to maybe do. so many uh, categories. But wouldn't, wouldn't there be some generalization? In other words, that would a person spurt up a hierarchy uh, if they started to do it? Yep. Comfortably, they gain confidence. Absolutely, because sometimes what people have imagined in terms of their fears, when they actually confront them, it's not this gigantic monster that they thought it was. Mm -hmm. And oh, this isn't, this isn't as hard as I thought, right? And yes, sometimes they progress more quickly, and it does generalize to other 
OCD categories. Did they have, I know that um, uh, this is a uh, empirically supported uh, treatment. Do they have data on how many people drop out before they get to the, the end of the process? That is an interesting question, and yes, the answer is yes, they have data. Um, now, what's interesting about the data is that a lot of the research on OCD is done in short programs to, get to, to enable them to complete the research. Literally, three-week or six-week programs, okay? And now we're going to see how many people drop out and how well people do. In order to complete treatment in that short amount of time, instead of starting very low on the hierarchy, we've got to start at things that are very difficult, right? That create a lot of anxiety. The, the higher you start, the more anxiety is created, the more chance they have of dropping out. Mm -hmm. So uh, Edna Foa, who is one of the leading researchers in the world on uh, treatment of OCD, uh, one of the people primarily responsible for really creating the ERP type of treatment. In her studies, 25% of the participants drop out of treatment. Okay? In, well, in what uh, context does she do this? Is it in a university lab? Or? It's, it's a university study with mm -hmm. people who are therapists who are trained to do this sort of treatment. Okay. Now, um, I ran the... Uh, OCD program at UCLA for 12 years and we have a lot of statistics there and basically our dropout rate was 4% because you would start at a lower we'd start, level we'd start at a lower level okay yep, exactly okay. so you know a lot of people think that um, that oh the, the, the treatment has to be better because we can't leave these 25% of people sort of untreated or, or not successful in treatment. And I don't really believe that's true if the treatment's done correctly and not in a research setting mm -hmm. where you can adapt it to the individual. Yeah, and was the, uh, the greater compliance with treatment or non-dropping out because you started at a lower level of anxiety, did you also have a maximum duration of sessions or is that impact too? Well, again, different programs have different um, uh, durations, basically. The UCLA program actually was a six-week program, but unlike the Edna Foa program, Edna Foa saw patients a few times a week, right? The UCLA program was five days a week, wow. right, for four hours a day. So it was a much more intensive program and we could get through many, and it, and it was all supervised, you know, with coaches rather than uh, having the patient go out in between sessions and do their own exposure. So if you had a, a client who uh, had the resources and the time uh, and let's say a fairly significant case of OCD, and they could, they could choose from any kind of setting and any kind of approach. What are the various treatment modalities, I mean settings really, private practice, um, um, all the way to inpatient? Yeah. What would you say is, is ideal? Well, again, in, that may depend upon the severity of the, uh, of the symptoms that the person's experiencing. Yeah. You do have self-help, and you have wonderful self-help. Yeah, maybe we should there. maybe we should lay out what the continuum is yeah. fully. Okay, so you you have self-help, and right. and self-help books written by people like Edna Foa and some of the leading people in the in in the uh, in the world, basically in treating OCD. Um, you have individual therapy where someone will come in on a once a week basis, uh, similar to what I've described in my private practice. You've got individual therapy where people might come in two or three times a week, so it's a mm -hmm. little bit more intensive. In intensive. Then you have uh, basically intensive treatment programs where usually people are coming in five days a week, right? And those could be done on an outpatient basis or even a residential treatment basis. So the most 
basically the most severe it, patients will go to a residential program where they, they live there, where the staff is trained, all the staff is trained in treatment of OCD. So they're getting 24 hour a day treatment basically. Right. So you really have to, you have to see what works for, for the particular person. In other words, if I'm seeing someone individually and they're not getting better because they come in and they say, I didn't do that assignment this week, right? I've got to consider would they be better off in a more structured program, a program where they they have coaches working with them every day. Well, that was, that was what was, was coming to my mind. Uh, do they have ERP coaches, mobile ERP coaches? In other words, let's say that you're doing outpatient therapy, and I, I guess I would always wonder if the individual was a completely objective reporter about how they were doing the uh, exposure and response prevention, you know, they could report to you, but you know, they're, 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 they may not be accurate reporters, but if there's, they're doing it with uh, an ERP coach That's right. or videotaping it. Yeah, yeah no, it, it would be more accurate. It, it seems almost silly though that someone would come in and say, you know, I did all these assignments this week and they all went really well and I didn't wash my hands at all and I didn't do any compulsions, let's go on to the next thing, when they really didn't do it. Yeah. I mean, it's It would be self-defeating, yeah. 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 I could see that. But, um, but uh, do they have, getting back to the question, do they have um, uh, ERP coaches that uh, are affiliated with clinics or affiliated with uh, active practitioners um, as, as, a, as a resource? Yes, that's that's they possible. Yeah. All the more intensive programs have the coaches, right? Right. Um, but certainly there are. There's two options on an outpatient basis. One is yes, there are people that assistants that you can hire that will go out and work with the patient in the environment. Yes. Right. The other option is to train family members oh, on, I how, see. on how to be a coach, basically. Okay, okay. And that's possible. It, it's a little tricky. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. But it, it is possible. Right. It, it's definitely, it's something that has to be done if you're working with a, with a child with OCD. Yeah. I, I don't do that. I, don't work, I only work with adults. But everybody who works with children basically uses the parents as Coaches. As your coach, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, we're going to have one of the the last master therapists going to be this uh, woman, Brenda Wiederhold, who is uh, um, really uh, has her expertise in the use of technology uh, in psychotherapy. And I could see how you could just do um, Skype-based observation. You know, at least a couple yep. of times, yep. checking the manipulation. Yep. Um, because that would give you more confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it would, do, do people do Skype-based uh, ERP work? I haven't. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues who really specialize in OCD do it. What you're saying actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because I'm thinking. If there was a problem, again, you know, yes, I'm, I'm going by what the person reports to me. Well, I'm thinking about it in two ways. One would be, as I, the context that I mentioned it, was checking that the person is doing the exposure and ritual prevention uh, the way that it's most effective. Yeah. So that's the one we're talking yeah. about. But I could also think about somebody who's in a rural area, mm -hmm. and while OCD treatment, as you said, has gotten more um, public awareness mm -hmm. and is more commonplace, uh, I could certainly see somebody who's in a rural area who might not have a practitioner who it has an expertise in these more um, uh, scientific approaches. And yeah. they may do some of the uh, old time work that's been discredited. Well, there's, there was actually, and this is back in about 1998, was the first sort of computer based program. Uh, for treatment of OCD. It was a program developed by Isaac Marks, who's in, um, in, in England. Um, it was called BT Steps, Behavior Therapy Steps. Mm -hmm. And it actually was designed and used 
to, because first of all, there weren't many therapists who were trained in treating OCD. And secondly, exactly what you said, to get people in rural areas who didn't have access to therapists. Right. Right. So they designed this program and had to do with both the computer and phone, they, they, phone instruction and stuff like that. But the research on it was terrific. Um, they, they had very, very good results with this. Um, it's actually uh, still in existence. It's a, now called OC Fighter. And you can buy it basically for, I think it's about $130. Yeah, yeah. One of the things we talked about in the class, you remember, about the difficulty of having a cross-state practice or mm -hmm. cross-national practice because there are, you know, a lot of HIPAA concerns about going over the uh, uh, the internet, and also some, uh, just to be honest about it, some uh, protectionist, you know, elements. But, um, and I understand that among the local practitioners. Um, but I, I also do see that um, a value of where there, if you can document that certain services are not available, yeah. it should be an ethical exclusion yeah. that you could practice across state lines. Yeah. But we're still trying to work out the, uh, the, the, the rules. The, the technology is far ahead of the, the ethics at this point. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, just a couple more questions and then maybe we'll throw it out you know, to, the, uh, to the group here and see what questions they have. Um, in certain forms of therapy, certainly in family and couples work and dynamic therapy, the relationship between the client or patient and the therapist is a, a critical um, a variable assumed to be a critical variable in treatment outcome. What role, if any, does the quality of the relationship that's established between the OCD therapist and the client play in treatment outcome, do you think? Yeah. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a great deal of research that's, mm -hmm. that's done on that. Um, I can tell you from, from my viewpoint, um, I think it is important. I think that OCD patients especially, they have to trust me. I'm asking them to do things that, that they're afraid of, that sometimes they're afraid might have horrible consequences. That they'll have a, right? a, a deep regression, they'll disintegrate, right? it, it, yeah, terrible well, fears. F f not fears, not just fears of that they'll disintegrate, but, you know, I'll give you an example, again. Um, there's one patient that I had that had a fear that she would stab her, her uh, fiance. Mm. Right? And one of the assignments she had was she was going to hold a butcher knife right up to his chest, okay? Until she felt How like, did he feel about this assignment? Uh, what? <laughs> oh, he, he, it was with his, perm his permission, right? Okay. But, but think about it. You have to trust your therapist. You have to be able to, to really have a good relationship and believe that, you know, I'm telling her something that she can do right and that's therapeutic right yeah um, and so I think it's important I really do yeah and what about in terms of your interview and what you learn about them it's a deep understanding but symptom centric yes whereas in a more uh, dynamically oriented therapy that you're trying to understand the um, presenting issues in a very wide and deep developmental context sure. and that's that's um, um, you know there's different theories about why that's important but one of them is um, that the, the fact that the person feels not just they trust you but that you know them deeply as a person. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be as critical. Just the I, I, I don't I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. And certainly um, that doesn't take place in this type of therapy. Um, it's certainly a very, very different type of therapy than saying, we've got to figure out how you became this person. We've got to figure out why these symptoms might have started. Right? Yeah, and is, is yeah. and I was gonna bring that up, the, the etiology yeah. issue uh, causes um, I know it's not critical for the therapy itself, 
but how do you think about how this comes about? Well, my, my belief at this point is that, first of all, that there is a genetic component. Yeah. Right? That people are predisposed towards anxiety disorders and, and, and OCD. Can I, can I just yeah. interrupt one second? Because remember one of the readings, there was some speculation coming out of the neuroscience work that there are some uh, pathways between the frontal lobe and the basal ganglia, which governs uh, motor responses and, and inhibitory responses, that there's something in that connection mm -hmm. that may be a vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then the question is, well, when, when does it come out? Yes. Right? And I certainly am one to believe that it comes out during times of stress for most people. And it's similar to, to other psychiatric, psychological problems. But they'll stumble that, into it? In other words, well, let's say, for example, you're under heightened stress. Yeah. You have neural pathways that do not inhibit or you get into mm -hmm. some kind of spiraling or repetitive you know, process. Um, and you, you just go around struggling to find something and something arbitrarily calms you for a moment, right. and you stumble onto it. Yep, I I, I think so. Um, you know, look, the the majority of patients who develop OCD are between the ages of 18 and 25 when the symptoms first occur. Now that's similar to a lot of other psychological disorders. Yeah, it's also a time of extreme stress and change. That's and the final place. spur to brain development. Yep, that too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, so, it's so much easier to figure out once it starts why it continues than it is to figure out exactly why it started. If you were a parent and you saw a child who had a kind of compulsive orientation, I was telling you about this one uh, person that um, I was giving you a little bit of a history. Um, remember the uh, young man who was arranging the cars yes. at a very young age. So that's a kind of compulsive behavior. Yep. Do children normatively in development have compulsive behaviors? Or, um, and would that just be a developmental stage? Or if they don't, and you saw that, mm -hmm. would you think this uh, person may have a predisposition at a later point in development to um, to develop these symptoms? Uh, yes, I would think the, would. the latter. Right? Yeah. That they so is there, is there preventative work? In other words, are there teachers, yeah. are there parents who are told that, you know, don't be alarmist if a child has certain rituals at bed, they want to hold their blanket in a certain way, don't freak mm -hmm. out. But if you see things that are clearly compulsive in nature, I'll just share with, with them what I mentioned to Jerry about a, a, a client that we both, we both know uh, who told me, because you were, I think, supervising the, the ERP work with this uh, individual, and I was working with their family. So we, we had a, a common pathway here. Um, and I mentioned to Jerry that when I was talking with the parents, they mentioned to me that when he was four years old, he was taking little metal cars and arranging them in a fixed order on a long sofa. And if anybody sat on that sofa and disrupted the positioning of the cars, he would get extremely upset. So um, that to me seems unusual for a young child. And that might alert you that there is sure. some possible yeah. predisposition. So what would one, you know, if you, if you saw a kid like that, what might one do? Is there anything one could do? I actually think there is. I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, so I don't have OCD, right? Okay. Um, I have a son who doesn't have OCD. Okay. Right? And when my son was a teenager, uh, I've always had dogs, right? My son came home one day and said, I'm not petting the dog anymore, right? And he had never said that before, right? And I had worked with so many people that had OCD, I said, Michael, said, not only are we both going to pet the dog. We're going to hug the dog. <laughs> we're, no, we're, we're going to 
pet the dog, and then we're going to go eat some potato chips right out of the bag uh -huh. with our hands, right? All right. That was the last that that ever happened, and he ever said it. Now, again, he, this was not a kid that necessarily was predisposed to OCD. Right, right. But if we treat symptoms when they occur initially, that will never turn into an OCD. So has anybody written about how parents should respond to potential compulsive um, defenses against anxiety in order okay. to avoid um, as a pre preventative, protective? I've, ne I've never seen it written about. Um, again, I don't treat children, so there may be, may be some literature right. on that. Well, I teach but, developmental. Yeah, I've never seen yeah, anything like that. Yeah. But it sounds like from what you're saying that you might prevent a lot of misery for people. If it's not if, dynamically based, and if it's a stress-based reaction, give them the coping tools yeah. to handle that anxiety. Yeah, I mean, if you take the kid lining up cars, right, yeah. and the first time it happens, and again, <laughs> the, the caveat is I, I don't treat treat children, right? Yeah. But it's just like, oh, isn't that cute, right? Right. Lines up all the cars, right. right? But now he keeps doing it, right? At some point, you know, you have, I think as a parent, yeah. you'd have to learn to recognize that this is a problem and to, to intervene. Mm -hmm. And maybe it doesn't become an issue. Right. Because, I mean, again, speaking developmentally, there are kids who have certain kinds of props that they need for sleeping sure absolutely. and certain rituals that they need for sleeping in order for them to feel secure and comfortable and that's that's normative up to a certain yes. certain but, amount but, but even even to some extent um we all have rituals right but they're not necessarily that doesn't mean we have all of ocd i drink orange juice every morning mm -hmm. does that mean i have ocd well, if we take your orange juice away, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, you know, so uh, and we t we'll talk about uh, treatment of people with insomnia. Right. We want people to have a ritual. Here's what you do every night before right. bedtime. Right, right. right? And so to make it structured. So to some extent, yes, there can be rituals that are, that are helpful, that are beneficial, but in some sense they cross the line and, yeah. and it becomes problematic. Right, right. Okay, well, let's, uh, thank you. Let's uh, just open it up and for questions that, that people have. Yeah, Erin? Um, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Welcome. I um, work at an outpatient place, and I do the work with, like, um, supervising exposure and response prevention. And when you were talking way back in the beginning about, like, a newer idea about inhibitory learning, yes, um, that, like, was really interesting to me that that was like um, that that was something that people think can work with OCD because what we're told is to not um, give any sort of reassurance that everything's mm, going to be okay. Like mm -hmm. right now, I have a person who's de like deathly afraid of getting acne, and some you know we have him touch really really dirty things and then rub his right. face, and he could get acne from that. Yeah. You know, some things you will not get whatever you're afraid of, something like that, it's impossible, some things, but this right. isn't an instance where you very well could. Mm -hmm. And the idea isn't to prove to you that you won't, mm -hmm. but it's like, of course, to prove that, or to, to have you learn that you can sit there and be anxious or have that well, not the, die. The tolerating the anxiety is part of the inhibitory learning approach. That That's is. one aspect okay. of it. But so is the aspect of, of sort of seeing that things are safe. Mm -hmm. You don't reassure them, mm -hmm. right? You don't tell them everything's going to be okay. They, they see it for themselves mm -hmm. through, the, through the exposures. Uh, Jonathan Abramowitz is the person who's probably written the most about this. Um, and it's interesting because it, it's not something, as I said, that everybody agrees with. It's not something that's proven mm -hmm. at this point, but it's a newer theory basically of of um how to treat ocd gotcha. mm -hmm. yeah. okay yes um you mentioned the, the woman who was like always touching her breasts like yeah but she didn't really know why and yeah. that just made me wonder um do you, is uh hypochondria very commonly comorbid with ocd 
Oh, you, may, you might want to repeat the question. So, oh, sure. Um, yeah. So the question was basically is hypochondria uh, comorbid with, with OCD? Um, you know, th there's this aspect of anxiety that I like to call and a lot of other people like to call health anxiety that crosses over very uh, between a number of different diagnoses, basically. There's certainly some OCD involved in it. There's certainly some generalized anxiety involved in it, um, maybe even specific phobia um, involved in it also. Um, so to me, it, it, is, it, it is possibly just another OCD symptom, right? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if, if somebody came in for health anxiety, there's a specific protocol that I follow without necessarily labeling it as OCD or generalized anxiety. I tell them they have health anxiety and this is how we're going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, good question. Another, another, yeah, go ahead. Um, going back to the child who like, lined up the cars, um, it reminded me of someone I know, and I worked over the summer with children with autism who had very similar things. That if something was thrown off order, it was very upsetting. Did autism <coughs> and OCD really like, overlapped, or is that just more something related to autism? Again, yeah, no, if you could repeat the question. Uh, the question basically is, uh, does autism overlap with OCD? Um, there's, a, I think, a significant incidence of OCD in autism. Um, I, personally, I've treated a number of people on the spectrum that actually do very well with the CBT treatment because it's a very structured treatment and they sort of like that, sort of uh, works for them. Um, but, um, you know, I certainly have seen a number of cases like that more where I would say are Asperger type of patients than autistic patients per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Like it. Uh, one of the articles said that OCD is often comorbid with depression. Yeah. So I was wondering if once the OCD is treated, does the depression usually go away? And if not, do you treat the depression or do you something okay. similar? So the question is, um, is OCD comorbid with depression? And what happens when you treat the OCD? Does the depression go away? First of all, sometimes it, it surprises me when someone has essentially severe OCD and they're not depressed mm -hmm. because of how much it interferes with their life. So the question always becomes, is the depression secondary to the OCD? In which case, you know, and I, I might even ask them during assessment, I said, well, the OCD were, were to, uh, to miraculously disappear tomorrow, would you still feel depressed? And most patients actually will say no, mm -hmm. right? So we don't usually focus on the OCD, uh, excuse me, on the, on the depression when we treat OCD, right? Because it often is secondary. And most of the research shows that the depression will improve greatly if the OCD is treated successfully. Now, if it doesn't, or if the, or if it doesn't, at that point, yes, I would treat the depression. I could still do cognitive behavioral therapy for depression with that particular individual. However, if the depression is primary and the OCD is secondary, right, now you might have to treat the depression first because what's one of the symptoms of depression? Lack of motivation. Right? lack of energy. Mm -hmm. They're not going to participate in a lot of the um, OCD assignments and exposures. Right? So you might want to treat the, the depression first and then treat the OCD in that case. One of the criticisms of a lot of uh, clinical studies is that they try, at least initially when they first did this, to eliminate comorbidities. Mm -hmm. But I think anyone who's in practice knows that comorbidity is oftentimes the, uh, is a very common situation. Yeah. Um, how do you, um, do you, do you feel that some of the clinical uh, studies have been too simplistic in that sense? Well, they're, they're trying to figure out what works, yeah. right? And, yeah. 
and that I understand from a research go, perspective. Go on a basic level and then try yeah. to expand it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but certainly to me, uh, research is very, very different than the real world and, yeah. and seeing patients. And, you, you know, I don't work from a manual that says this is what we're supposed to do in the third session. And if the person happens to come in and say, I worked on this, uh, you know, been working on this OCD, and by the way, yesterday my father died. Um, it's like, no, 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 we've got to go back to uh, working on your exposures. Right. Um, the real world is different. Right, right. That's a good point. Yeah, Camila? Um, so you said that OCDs are a genetic component, yeah. but do you think that personality and profession school trigger also OCDs? Um, tell me a little bit more. What do you mean? Like, for example, the, um, the woman that you said she was a physician yes. and she had OCDs. Do you think because she was a physician and being so, like, you need to be clean and you need to be... Um, so, with, so with certain yeah. um, professions predispose or be be more likely to produce a, a OCD? I think people's OCD symptoms are developed in part as a result of their real world experiences. So yes, it would for, for that person, it would be very common because they have to do so many things related to to cleanliness and, and um, you know, washing and everything when they, they're in surgery and things like that, that that would be a, a, a symptom that might come up for that person who is prone for OCD. In somebody else, it, you know, it, it may be a totally different uh, sort of world experience that they had and their symptoms might be related to their own sort of upbringing and, their, and what they've been exposed to. It, it, you know, it's interesting, and I mean, I've been uh, treating OCD for a long time, and you know, what you what will happen is that no one will have a specific symptom until perhaps maybe there's an article in the newspaper. Woman drives her car into the lake and her children drown. You remember, anybody remember that one? Mm -hmm. um, okay. No one ever came into therapy and said, I'm afraid that I might drive my kids, you know, into the lake and, and, and kill them. Mm -hmm. After that happened, people came in and were afraid of that. Mm -hmm. So you pick up on what's happening and fears. I mean, obviously, at some point, there were no AIDS fears. Certainly when I was growing up, there, there, there weren't AIDS fears, right? There were fears about uh, STDs. Right, but not not AIDS, and AIDS comes and, mm -hmm. and you know so what in part some of the symptoms I think are what you're exposed to. Give you one other example, which I think is a good one. So I had a woman who uh, had a uh, a cleaning cleaning compulsions was a, not necessarily afraid of contamination, but everything had to be spotless and clean. And I'm doing a home visit, and she has a stainless steel refrigerator, right? You can't get fingerprints on the stainless steel, right? So she has to open the, the refrigerator with a paper towel, right? Not because it's contaminated, but that it would be dirty, right? If she, if she touched it with her fingertips. Um, so I'm, I'm at home, in her home, and one of her children says, Mom, I need, I forget what it is, I want some juice, right? What does she do? She says, it's in the refrigerator. Make sure and take the paper towel before you open the refrigerator. Right? Now, let's forget about the genetic component for a minute. Right? What are you teaching your, your child? Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And you know, it's very clear that that's another factor that can create OCD. What did you, what did your, um, uh, what did you learn? Basically, right, right. Up. What about culturally? I mean, are there do they have data on different cultures that um, have a higher incidence of uh, OCD? I think the incidence, in, interestingly, the incidence is similar in just about all countries. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the research that I've seen, um, whether again people get treatment for it again, M maybe, maybe the content is different. The content different may be different according yeah. to to yeah. yeah. 
Okay, how about one more question? Any last, uh, go ahead, Reed. Um, so I know that a lot of people's um, obsessions may not be rational things, yeah. but I'm wondering if there's, if you've ever had someone or heard of someone where, say, their um, OCD symptoms are related to cleanliness and contamination, and they happen to touch a doorknob maybe in an exposure session, and then happen to get sick the next week, yeah. and just progress. Has that ever happened? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I, I never want to reassure patients, right? But I'll give them this general statement at the beginning of, of when they're starting to do exposures, right? I say, I'm going to ask you to do some things that you don't particularly want to do, that you might be afraid of. Two things are going to happen, right? The first thing is, what you're afraid of is never going to occur, okay? I want to tell you that to start with. But you know what? That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that your anxiety and your fear about doing this will decrease. That's the most important thing. So if you ask me right now, has, has anyone, has, if I ask someone, I've got, I've got a guy this week uh, putting papers next to uh, an electrical outlet because he's afraid the house will burn down. He usually pulls all the plugs out before he leaves. Right? Has any house ever burnt down when I have asked someone to do that? Has anybody ever gotten AIDS? Has someone gotten a cold? Yeah, maybe, you know, but, um, but in terms of their real fears, mm -hmm. the real catastrophes, they never happen, right? So um, th that's basically what, what I think. <laughs> All right, well, I think uh, we should give uh, Dr. Car Tarlow a big hand for <laughs> You, you have so much experience and so much expertise in this area. It's been a really pleasure. All right. Thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting me.